My name is Martin Nietzsche, and I'm happy and proud to say hello to all of you and to say that we are starting with our next payment dialogue. We have a very, very interesting topic today, which led to a lot of registrations and a lot of interest about cryptocurrencies. I would have been happy to get a little bit of knowledge about that topic, let's say, five years ago when they were really cheap. And I would have been, well, let's say, um, eager enough to invest some money five years ago. Probably I wouldn't be here today. Probably I would be lying in the sun somewhere on Mauritius now. So maybe it's good that I did not invest in cryptocurrencies five years ago. So otherwise, I couldn't have been here. But it's an interesting topic. But it's not only interesting from a personal point of view, but I think it's as well very interesting if you look at it from an economy point of view, if you look at it from a society point of view, and as well from a postal operator point of view. So I'm proud and I'm really happy about this interesting topic. And I'm happy to have two people here with me. One is Armin Schmid. We will talk a little bit later about Armin because he's the most important person today. And the other one who is with me is Sergey. Sergey from the UPU. I, well, I would just say, Sergey, it's your show. You are the one who made all this possible. You are the one who is paying for all of this. So I would say, Sergey, up to you. Yeah, thanks, Martin, for giving me the opportunity to open this workshop. And good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Again, depending on your time zone and the country you are. Well, I'm glad to welcome you to the FORCE. Now it's the FORCE webinar in our series. And this is a joint initiative uh, of the UPU and the Postal Payment Services User Group. Actually, this series uh, is aimed at better understanding the nature of the payments, the trends, and also the best practices in um, the postal financial services, and also making advantage from new technology developments across the globe. You all know that posts all over the world are recognized as trusted uh, public service providers. They have a global network, and they traditionally uh, best partners in the delivery, uh, delivery of accessible and affordable financial services, especially when we're talking about social payments and remittances. And that is, of course, crucial for the end bank populations. The UPU itself and uh, IB uh, particularly is constantly assisting member countries in this area of financial services development. And specifically, that is done by building a worldwide electronic postal payment network, which is based on the legal framework in the form of the UPU International Treaty, which is called Postal Payment Services Agreement. Uh, furthermore, a trademark, a recognized brand, uh, which is called Post Transfer, is also a useful tool that allows postal operators to provide their own modern money transfer services. Being aware of industry innovations, uh, the UPU is examining the role that new technologies in general, and especially blockchain and cryptocurrencies, of which we will talk today, uh, can play uh, in the postal industry. And of course, more specifically, the role of the UPU and the members of the UPU in enabling efficient delivery of financial services. In this regard, I would like also to mention that UPU is now leading a study on uh, distributed ledger technologies and its use for the postal sector. And this study is about to be finalized by the end of this year and presented uh, somewhere in January. The objective of this particular webinar is to challenge operators and uh, all those who are attending this webinar with some thoughts on the use of cryptocurrencies in the payments business area and how POST could potentially use them to incentive uh, further improvements of uh, payment services. I hope that we all will get some insights of what uh, role cryptocurrencies are playing now and of course, what are our customers' needs nowadays. On the other end, from the UPU perspective, we will see how post-transfer service provided by the UPU can be improved to better respond to the present and future client needs and, of course, market demands. So thank you, Martin. That was my opening remarks. And I'm uh, back to you. Thanks, Sergey. 
Interesting thoughts. How can cryptocurrencies be alias or are they threats to postal payments and to postal operators? And uh, I think that's a question that's probably not only postal operators are asking themselves nowadays. If I would be the manager of a bank, I would ask probably the same question. I would be the manager of a big uh, vendor or a big um, operator. I would ask the same question. So I think it's probably a question where we can exchange postal payments to something else and everybody is asking the same question. So I'm very happy that we have a very interesting colleague of us, Armin Schmid, with us, who is one, one of the real experts in these topics. And if I mean, if I say real experts, he is not only talking about that, he is not from the, only the scientific side, but he is from the practical side of that topic. And I think especially for cryptocurrencies, there are a lot of people out there who talk about the topic but don't really know about the topic. And with Armin, I know is that he not only talks about it, he really knows about it. So I'm very happy that we have him here. Before I give over to Armin, um, two things from my side. The first one is the series is called Payment Dialogue. It's not called Payment Monologue. So for the last five minutes, we spoke. And for the next 30 minutes, Armin will speak. But after that, we would really like to go into, into an interesting dialogue with all of you. So if you have questions, please put them in the message box in the chat. Ask them already. We will all collect these questions. If you want to do it with talking as well, put it in the, in the chat and I will put you on afterwards, put you on with your camera and your microphone and we all can get into a dialogue. And please really do that because we have only 30 minutes of presentation and we want to do something very worthwhile with your time after that. So we are open for a discussion with all of you. I'm very interested in the dialogue about this very interesting topic. That was the first point. The second one is Armin. You are head um, of Bitcoin, Swiss and Pay and Stablecoins. But you have a very interesting CV. You were started with McKinsey. You were working for a big uh, cable operator. You were working for eBay. You were working for PayPal. And now you're working um, in another um, position again. And I think it's interesting to see that you can talk about this from a consultancy perspective, from a, from a eBay perspective, from a PayPal perspective. So you have very different views on this interesting topic. And I think that's what makes it very interesting. Armin, over to you. I'm not talking any longer. The stage, the floor is yours and we are all very interested about what you can say. Please put on your, um, on your screen sharing and then we can start with the presentation. Excellent. Um, before I start screen sharing, I just would like to say thank you for the opportunity and thank you for um, having me here as a speaker. Um, there are two things, only two things I would like to bring across today. One, please use crypto, test it out, give it a try, um, because in the end you have to, as we would say, make your fingers dirty to really try it out, to test it out, to see how this really works. And the second is think a little bit what I'm going to share with you right now. And I think... Um, I have a couple of thoughts put together. I don't give you somehow a recommendation. For me, it is it is just very important that I would love to make you think. That's the only thing I wanted to do today. And I'm sharing right now with you a presentation, which is actually here. And I hide it here. And so we can talk a little bit about um, the cryptocurrencies as allies or threats to postal payments. Um, just uh, one word about Bitcoin Swiss. Bitcoin Swiss is uh, one of the biggest um, crypto broker, at least in Europe, um, but definitely amongst uh, the top ones also in, uh, in the world. Uh, we work with um, exchanges mainly, and our main business is buying, hosting, keeping and selling cryptos. That's, that's our main business. And we have some side uh, businesses as well. But today, it's more about uh, the payments, more about the potential impact. And uh, the agenda is as follows. What is money? What is Bitcoin? In very short. So I don't want to make this too long. What's the impact of Bitcoin? And what is the impact on postal payments? And here on the right-hand side, you, you see 
how US dollars are printed. Maybe um, we will come back to this, but um, give you the thought, what is money? Who can print money? And maybe cryptos are definitely a good alternative to this. Um, stepping back a little bit, evolution of money from bartering to cryptocurrencies. I think back in the days, we traded a sheep against some, some grains. So, uh, sooner or later, we had some physical objects like the shells who became a part, like something like a currency, something like a valuable asset. Paper money is not that old, so um, obviously a couple of hundred years, but it's not that far back that it was invented. Gold was always somehow important, but the question was always a little bit, to what extent can you really carry around gold? Because in the end, it, it's heavy. Um, digital or, um, yeah, credit card-like uh, models uh, came about 60, 70 years ago. And I think uh, especially electronic money, I used to work for PayPal, uh, in my view, made a big change actually to today's cryptocurrencies. And the reason why cryptocurrencies with Bitcoin started uh, 2009 was linked to the financial crisis in 2008, which led to a new model, how really this money thing could be dealt with also on an ongoing basis. By the way, everything backwards is still possible. So we still can barter. We still have paper money. We still have gold. We still use credit cards. And so it's an evolution, and it doesn't really mean that you exclude something from the past. And I think that's the beauty. So it is a coexistence. People once in a while say, will cryptocurrency take it all over? No, they will not. In the end, they are a part of the integrated value chain in, in financial services. Um, just a quick yeah, a little, little intro. What is money? It is a medium of exchange. So you can trade goods and you can buy it with something. It's a store of value. You can have uh, some, some banknotes in your pocket. You can have bitcoins on a mobile wallet or in a wallet itself. And you can divide it. So you have 100 Swiss francs or 100 US dollar. You have 20 US dollar notes. You have 10, you have 5, you have coins. And I think... This makes it all up. And this is important also looking towards cryptocurrencies afterwards. So it's a medium of exchange. It's a store of value and it's a unit of account. So it can be divided. Um, looking back uh, from the ones in Europe, who remember those banknotes? I did. And I just looked yesterday also into some of my old cones. I still have it in a, in a box at home. I found some Lira and some uh, Franc as well. And... Uh, they're all gone. The euro took over. And for me, the next slide, this slide here, is actually quite important to, to look at. Yes, the US dollar today at the very bottom is a very important global currency. Everybody's talking about US dollar. And it is, in the end, still somehow um, the most important uh, currency today. But we see also that other markets are taking up. And in history... Obviously, we had different currencies who were the leading currencies back in the days. So let's talk about the real. Let's talk about the, the Dutch guild. Let's talk about the pound. And once in a while, they had a little bit a longer period. And once in a while, they had a little bit shorter period. And with the current situation the Americans uh, are putting the dollar into, maybe there is sooner or later time for a change. No threats here, but maybe... The US dollar is not always what it was and maybe what it will be going forward. Um, that's a little um, chart just showing how much money was printed recently. And this is a little bit to the picture I showed at the beginning. Who is really printing money? What is the real value behind money which gets printed, be it in the US or be it in Europe or be it also in Switzerland or any other markets? In the end, the supply is a big a big issue in the end from my perspective from a crypto uh, perspective towards inflation and it is just a nice picture here um, how us dollar is basically worth nothing today compared to a couple of years ago and that's all linked to inflation and just imagine you had 100 euros a couple of years ago it's basically worth nothing if you just kept your money on a bank account, it's worth nothing. 
and not nothing, but basically nothing. And so the big the big question is how can you somehow escape this trap? How can you make sure that you as a individual or as a company or as a postal service are using the right the right the right currency for your for your business? Um, that's not me. That's the Deutsche Bank research, and I wanna, don't want to go through the, the the statement on the left hand side. But the main summary here is there are doubts about the sustainability of fiat money, like US dollar or like like uh, like euros, etc. The demand for alternative currencies is absolutely there, and we need a balance, really, to somehow make sure the dilemma is solved between higher yields and the record level of debt. Future generation have somehow to pay those debt. That's about money. I just wanted to give you some thoughts. You can take your own decisions where and how you invest your own or your company or your postal money into. What is Bitcoin? I keep this very short because in the end, um, that's just a very rough overview about uh, DL, the, the distributed ledger technology and also Bitcoin. But I think it's still, it's still very valid. On the left hand side, you see um, a traditional bank setup, a dish, uh, traditional centralized setup where a ledger, where a documentation like a big Excel sheet somehow is centralized, ho centrally hosted in a clearinghouse. On the right hand side, you have a more decentralized setup where different ledgers, different positions are shared amongst more um, positions. And uh, obviously, that's the big difference between a centralized unit or a decentralized or distributed uh, setup. And on the on the crypto side, you basically can see that we are definitely on the on the far right side, where an independent group of people, where an independent group of software, where codes, where servers, where nodes, as we call them, somehow manage this ledger uh, on a decentral level. And so the traditional business here at the top, you have a client A who wants to send some money to a client B. One sits in 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 in, in South America, and the other sits in in uh, Vietnam, for example. It takes days. It takes maybe even weeks to send money from A to B. And therefore, on the blockchain side, we are all together, and we have an immediate transaction. And that's one of the main reasons here. So you can see here the little the little question here. Can postal transfer um, be used? Um, can, can cryptos be used for postal transfers? Can money orders maybe be used for this? Because in the end, you have an immediate transaction. It can be Bitcoin. It can be something else. I will come back to this as well. And this is an important picture. This, this was very important for me to really understand why Bitcoin is there. Top left. A compact disk. If you do a copy of a compact disk, you don't see which one was the original. Yes, maybe you have a different uh, label, but from a content wise, it's exactly the same. We can talk here about a copy of an MP3 file. It's exactly the same. No change. Copy of a gold coin. Yes, of course, you can see. Uh, you can double check if gold is still there. But the beauty and the most one of the most important problems which got solved with Bitcoin is I can clearly identify a digital good to an address. Maybe a person afterwards behind, I can put this in half and I can say I own half a Bitcoin and you own half a Bitcoin. But this double spend problem has completely been solved. So I cannot really spend the coin twice because in the end, I know, everybody knows who owns this Bitcoin. And this was the real innovation in the end of um, Bitcoin, uh, which really triggered the entire industry. You can transfer digital goods in an international, in a multi whatever setup, and you clearly can identify who is behind it. And that's the beauty about cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Um, this is just uh, a nice overview. And for me, there are a couple of important statements here. So Bitcoin started, as I mentioned, in 2009, shortly after the um, financial crisis. Um, the code, and I think that's the important element, the code is the monetary policy. The miners who are really running everything, they get rewards for running and keeping the system alive. 
there is a maximum supply of 21, 21 billion, million bitcoins, which ex is expected to be printed in something like uh, 2140, so in the year 2140. So there's no one who can say, oh, I just increased the money. I just increased the, value, the, the, the number of bitcoins. No, it's a given 21 million bitcoins, and that's it. Right now, we still can mine some new bitcoins. In the future, there are no more new bitcoins be um, created. And then uh, people are always talking about uh, why does it uh, need so much energy? That's part of the security. So this is called proof of work. And this generates, in the end, the secure setup of everything here. And there are two, um, two notes down here. Um, there's a white paper from uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Please have a look at it. It's just about 10, 15 pages. It's not that complex. That's all about what really Bitcoin is all about. And then there's another one, um, the Bitcoin um, node, as it's called, it, this uh, full node sculpture. It's a, it's a very nice overview, really, to put in a couple of very simple terms the uh, full setup of Bitcoin into, into, into a quite digestible setup. Um, what is the, the base for growth in crypto payments? And now let's switch a little bit more over to this side here. You need somehow adoption. And adoption is, a, is, a, is something of awareness, about access and convenience. And, and especially the convenience side uh, in the crypto business is not always that easy. So many people are always thinking, oh, that's, that's quite a complex business. And uh, the access is not that easy. And I need a mobile wallet. And awareness is apparently there. But if I would see you in person, I would ask, how many people own crypto? Yes, I own crypto and luckily I invested a couple of years ago. I still don't can go to Bahamas and just uh, have a good time kite surfing. I'm a kite surfer, uh, but I still like actually my job. And I think it's a good one that we can also somehow bring this idea further to, to, uh, to an international community. We can ask um, the question, Armin. We have a, a chat here, so we can ask the question live. So anybody who is having bitcoins or some other cryptocurrencies like ethereum just say yes into the chat and let's see if somebody is outing himself i have probably to say no so i should say no um but there are some people let let's let's have a look whether uh one two three four five six seven not yet not yet <laughs> abby is saying not yet so, but seven or eight said yes. So, um, as we are nearly 100 people now, I would say about 10% having cryptocurrencies. Which is excellent. Um, I don't see it because I'm still sharing my presentation, but I'm very happy to see that somehow the, the initial coin, let's call it this way, is somehow distributed. And let's continue. Let's see how um, crypto is going to even um, uh, invades further into maybe your wallets and your 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 wealth because in the end I'm Bitcoin thinking is about clean. that <laughs> <laughs> I continue here um I think that's that's a very simple chart and I think it's an analogy of the internet and um, for me it is important actually to to show when we really started uh, the internet many, many years ago, and I was happily part of uh, the evolution, be it with uh, the telecommunications business, but also with eBay or PayPal, um, the crypto business is much faster. And you would see here, this is, this is what I put into, by the way, um, because I believe the adoption is much, much faster compared to when we started or when, when the internet was started years ago. Because back in the days, I remember when I was at eBay, people thought, ah, what is this all about and how can you somehow sell goods across the internet? Yes, of course you can. I can tell you. There's a lot, there's a lot happening in the internet right now. And therefore, the adoption, that's the main, that's the main um, uh, takeaway here, is huge. And we can see a huge growth amongst the community as well. And here, the same. Uh, it depends a little bit on the region by region. But the, the big question actually is, why do we need uh, cryptos? And why do people invest into crypto in certain markets? I come back to El Salvador a little bit later. But I think the important element is, do you trust in the monetary system? Do you trust in someone who just can print the money? Have you seen some banknotes with many, many, many zeros behind it? 
maybe it's rather uh, better to invest into cryptos where you know there are only 21 million there and there's nothing more which can be printed. So the wealth obviously behind the cryptocurrency is definitely there and the stability of, uh, of, the, of the cryptocurrency. That's a little overview uh, just to give you a flavor about about the major um, uh, cryptocurrencies and and that's a very basic one it's um, available at coin360.io and you see this was a couple of days ago bitcoin is if it's roughly 40 to 50 percent of the total valuation of cryptos so it's huge if you know bitcoin and maybe ethereum here is you're already perfect and uh, no financial advice you can go and invest into any other or smaller um, um, currencies Start somewhere and see that Bitcoin and ETH are obviously the big two ones. Um, switching back um, also to uh, another topic, and I just uh, want to uh, quickly talk about this as well. Here uh, you see the, the native cryptos uh, like Bitcoin and ETH, but you also see some other ones like USDT, uh, USDC. Those are crypto uh, currencies, so-called stable coins. So they are linked to an underlying value. And here you have some private institutions like Tether or USDC. You also have some smart contracts. So basically, it's again a protocol that is giving you somehow the value behind the token. And then you have central banks who are thinking or are doing already centrally distributed um, uh, coins, so-called CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. And the question is always, who do you trust? Do you trust a central body? Do you trust a protocol or do you trust the ECB or the Chinese uh, government or you name it? And the big question is maybe you do a little bit of all, but at least here you have a, a valid and solid backing of the current fiat, let's say US dollar um, uh, value into the blockchain delivered. I think that's an important one here. And you can also see that the volume of those so-called stable coins have grown significantly um, over, the last, over the last years. No further to uh, talks about this, because in the end, I would like to talk, and I think now the main, the main topic, having gone from the idea, what is money, what is Bitcoin, and what is now the impact of Bitcoin? I think that's, that's, so, that's, that's really important to understand. And that's just a snapshot of how in the financial and in the payment industry, Bitcoin is, is, is very much, and the cryptos are very much in the heart of everybody. And you can see a couple of uh, names here. So you see Tesla, Tesla's accepting. Visa and MasterCard are investing heavily, mainly into patents. But as major credit card companies uh, are definitely very interested in what's the evolution of the transfer i can tell you it is it is essential that they are looking into this we have wordline here in switzerland uh, partnering with us um, that you can accept bitcoin and eth at the point of sale or in the internet i will show you then again how this really looks like paypal obviously very active paypal is also giving access to to cryptocurrencies and uh, recently el salvador i come back to el salvador as well and as of today for example we are also um we just have launched today uh, the going live of lightning which is a layer two protocol on bitcoin don't want to go into much details there but you see the evolution is is there and we went live with lightning which makes it even much faster and much easier Important was also here Novi. Novi is um, um, linked to Facebook and um, um, uh, just escaped my name, obviously. Um, uh, Martin, help me. The ones in Geneva, uh, um, Facebook, did the digital currency. Anyway, uh, just, just for that all the big ones were in the, at the starting point. They started to be part of, of Libra. Was it MS? Libra? Libra. I was looking for the Libra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Sorry, I just escaped. didn't really uh, remember the word anymore. But yes, Libra made it very clear and very prominent also in the market that, hey, this crypto thing is there to stay. And um, that's, that's, a very important, that's a very important element there. Um, for market rents. And I can tell you, um, I'm an engineer. 
So I have a degree in material science. I have a business degree, but about 50% of my time is legal, regulatory, and compliance. Is it fun for me? Not really, but I can tell you it is important. And therefore, the first, the first point for me is key for you in the postal system to accept and use cryptocurrencies. It's the regulatory frameworks. They need to evolve. So in the end, it gives you also a certain stability in your, in your business. That's, that's one. Two, I also talked a little bit about, about those stable coins because the transaction of a stable coin across the, the, the blockchain is so much faster and would give you an idea how you can really uh, transact in, in, in seconds versus days or weeks in the past. So stable coins are going to give um, a, a huge benefit also for B2B companies and also for you in the postal uh, business. And then um, obviously bridging from the fiat currencies to the crypto world is, uh, is an important element. And somehow the infrastructure, the infrastructure is getting there. And SWIFT or ACH and other protocols, they are maybe a little bit in danger because there's something new coming. And then the, the transactional cost will boost second layer solutions. I was talking about Lightning. Um, so for example, in El Salvador, I come back to this, is, is such, such an important uh, element there. Maybe, maybe this is really going to be the revolution in the future. Um, talking about El Salvador, and maybe you have heard about this, why is El Salvador somehow um, in the press and why is El Salvador so important for us on a, on a crypto and Bitcoin level? El Salvador uh, said, I would love to say, or I, I declare Bitcoin as a legal tender. So everybody in El Salvador must accept Bitcoin when you want to, for example, would like to buy a, a Big Mac here, as the picture shows, or in any, any market, in any shop, you have to accept Bitcoin. And what was, what was the reason for this? There are three main, uh, three main points to mention. First, I think financial access. Um, El Salvador did no longer have their own currency. They were linked directly to the US dollar. And therefore, it was kind of, they were, they were somehow just linked to the US situation. And that, as, a, as, a, as a country, that's not that easy. Then 70% um, of the um, people in El Salvador that don't have access to financial systems. So in the end, it's really making sure that the non-banked and underbanked get access to it. 23% of the GDP is linked to remittances. And just imagine if, if you pay 10%, you pay then 10% to the Western unions of those world. And maybe obviously that's also business for you, but for you, you also have to see this as a threat. Therefore my title, is it a threat or is it an ally? And I leave it up to you obviously to see if you do remittances as well with your systems. And it's fully decentralized. That's my initial point. There is no one who can say, I just print another billion of US dollar. Second, uh, how is it done? It's via Bitcoin or via this uh, Bitcoin Lightning protocol, which is, uh, which is uh, just a faster and, uh, and more efficient, also cost efficient uh, setup. They have their own wallet and uh, it really generates fast and cheap transactions. And what is the impact? Obviously, El Salvador, you can say it's a smaller country, but it made a big impact on a, on a global basis. And I think it is key, and we have other, com other markets who will, who will follow there, but the, the independency from US dollar gives them obviously another freedom back. They used to have it, but now they have a freedom back. And yes, not everybody was happy, but it is also a global Bitcoin lavatory. And uh, other markets think about the same. So Panama, Ukraine, Cuba, or Zimbabwe, maybe even others. But it is a big statement towards the crypto um, industry and the crypto business. Bitcoin is there to stay. You can, you, can no longer, you can no longer stop Bitcoin. It's like a religion. You can say it's forbidden. You, you're not allowed to, to trade it anymore. You cannot, because in the end, it's fully decentral. And this is where exactly El Salvador uh, just uh, jumped into and said, hey, guys, I like it what you have. It's independent. And we would like to make sure that the non-banked and underbanked get access 
to financial systems, and this really means financial inclusion. Um, I show you quickly, and I'm coming towards uh, the end of my presentation. So what do we have here in Switzerland? So we have an integrated solution where um, you have, for example, a point of sale, or you can send out an invoice, or you can also have an e-commerce checkout, and where you can accept Bitcoin and Ethereum, and we collect it on, for example, the merchant's behalf. We switch it immediately to Swiss francs or US dollar or euro, and then we pay out the merchant um, in, in Swiss franc or in euro or in, in US dollar. And I think the beauty there is that you as a merchant can accept crypto, but you don't have to touch crypto. And I think that's a little bit in, in, in contract to what's really happening in El Salvador, because in El Salvador, you will accept crypto and you keep crypto because you trust this 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 currency more than you would trust any other currency like the US dollar. And here, at least, it's a bridge. And I think it's, that's, a, that's a big evolution. And I would like to, before I come to my questions, um, I would like to just say it is not a yes or no. It's something also in between. So you should make sure that you test it a little bit, you try to understand what is crypto all about, and then maybe you can pay with crypto and at least you see how it really works because it won't really work at the very beginning. So don't already uh, invest too much, but start small and grow along. And now what is the impact on, on postal payments? And, and that's actually my last slide. Um, I would love to somehow start the discussion because in the end, it is you who are going to decide. It is you who are going to somehow shape this future also in your business also in your postal setup in money transfers etc and so coming back to my question what do you think about uh, the financial future what do you think is bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies going to have an impact on can crypto solve money order issues ethics risks the settlement times takes weeks a bank, an institution says, oh, no, 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 I don't want to send this money to the other postal system. Is there an effective um, uh, increase when you use cryptos? Be it Bitcoin, like in El Salvador, or be it a stable coin, maybe, maybe that's the future. And then um, I also want to add here a little bit, maybe keeping crypto is the better wealth generator. If you would have invested into some Bitcoins five years ago, Maybe it's worth a little bit more compared to just keeping the US dollar on the bank account. And then uh, an important element here are stable coins, a potential alternative to bridge somehow the traditional, um, the traditional business right now with US dollars and, and euros, etc. to the bitcoins. That's something in between. And maybe that's the better solution for you. I don't know your business that well. I know a little bit about telecoms and e-commerce and payments, but the postal service obviously are on a global basis have huge transactions. And I can tell you with um, the stable coins, but also with Bitcoins, it's going to be much easier. I would stop here. I would like to thank you um, for, your, um, for, for your attendance. And um, I'm very happy to start the dialogue and obviously continue with um, a, good, a good discussion. Thanks. So, Armin, thank you so much. First of all, let me, do, let me do this here. This is done for all the attendees you're seeing um, in the audience. And... I can tell you one thing, Armin. We had a lot of payment dialogues over the last weeks and years. And we had several times good discussions. But we never had 10 questions already when you were ready with your presentation. And we never had a live discussion while you were presenting, which was um, bordering in sentences like central banks will disappear and things like that. So while you presented, there was already a very, very interesting discussion going on. And I'll try now my very best to moderate this discussion and to find a way to answer the questions for you and to, to integrate into this. So let me start in different uh, directions. Um, the first one is um, one I, I, I really think it's interesting. Um, if you use... Um, 
blockchain for more broadly for postal settlements, so between postal operators, would you have to use some kind of stable coin or could you use bitcoins, ethereums, uh, something like that? What, in which direction would you think for that? Anything goes. Um, if you use a stable coin, um, obviously, then you would have a um, uh, same value like a US dollar, for example, or you have a euro stable coin or you have um, another stable coin. So therefore, it is just one to one linked. But again, as I mentioned, you have to trust a central body like uh, the issuer of Tether or of USDC, which are companies behind it. Or you have a decentralized protocol. So you have to trust the protocol like in a DAI setup. Or you have to trust, again, someone who, from a central bank perspective, who is issuing this stablecoin. And in the Chinese um, uh, setup, they might just uh, freeze the tokens. And I don't know if this is something you would like to have. In the end, this is your money. And therefore, I'm, I'm convinced that in a public and decentralized setup, Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ether are much better, but obviously you have to live a little bit with the fluctuation of the value. It went up to 67,000 US dollar. It came down a little bit, little bit. So yes, that's a little bit the, the downside. But if you change it completely, and if you have your view purely from a Bitcoin perspective, your entire life gets cheaper because everything you will then spend in fiat is getting cheaper because the value of your bitcoins are going up. So there are many people who just flip it around completely. It's a it's a quite um, an interesting and long winded jump, but um, it might be the right jump actually for the future. It's interesting what need, what new what you need for a new way of thinking. If you if you try to get into that, there was another question I really liked is about the affordability so the question is is the bitcoin technology affordable particularly to developing postal organizations in the developing countries so what would you think about that is it more is it higher cost or is it maybe even lower cost so some of this is open source some some things are really easy to use so how would you how would you go into that question is it High invest, low invest, medium invest, normal invest. I would, I would personally say, but I'm obviously would have to look at it. It's an absolute low, super low invest because everything is public. Um, if you, if you, if you become participant of um, of blockchain, you, for example, in a private setup, you just need a wallet. Uh, this is now BRD, is it called, uh, on your mobile wallet? But you also can have a, an address, which is in the internet. So the only thing you need is internet. The second you need is a wallet, which is basically for free. And maybe you then obviously have to invest a little bit into security. So uh, your coins are not um, uh, somehow easy to be hacked. So the access to your coins uh, is easy to be hacked. So I personally believe it is absolutely cheaper much cheaper to, to use Bitcoin as a, as a payment um, protocol and payment transaction uh, system compared to any banking system. But yes, uh, so main access you need is internet and need power. And that's it. So it's not, not that, sorry, it's not that complex. And some security probably. Security, uh, yes. <laughs> Um, a very uh, practical question. Gustavo is answering uh, a questioning. Uh, fr uh, um, wants to know. I wanted to invest a while ago into bitcoins with Bitcoin Smiths, but they have raised the minimum amount of investment to 100k. Has this changed? Unfortunately, not. I can tell you, it's um, it's uh, it's uh, it's an issue we have in our company because. Um, the onboarding uh, is, is quite complex. So if you would like to get a, an account with Bitcoin Swiss and also other um, uh, brokers in Switzerland, the, the hurdles are pretty high. So they are similar or even higher compared to a bank, uh, bank account. And uh, so uh, we definitely had to raise this bar a little bit. But I can recommend you to go to alternative players, be it on an international level, but also on a, in Switzerland, there are a couple of uh, providers who um, are uh, providing you with uh, with an easy access 
free access, be it on a mobile device. Uh, the most important element, though, is, and I just give you this um, quote from uh, Andreas Antonopoulos, who is one of the very important um, players behind Bitcoin, not your keys, not your Bitcoin. So you need access to the so-called private keys. You, you need access to the, to, the, to the address where the Bitcoins are stored. And then you can really claim they are mine. If you, like someone else, is storing this on your behalf, that's a little bit of a different setup. What we at Bitcoin Swiss obviously do as well is that we make this custody, as it's called, um, for you. And so you don't have to care about this. It's like you have a, a bank account and you have some shares and a depot uh, in there. So you have some securities in there. You want to make sure that this uh, it's, a good, it's a good setup there as well and it's secure. But you can do all at your own. And the important element actually is with your mobile phone, you have an entire bank in your hand. And so, yes, Bitcoin Swiss is one of the brokers, but there are many other players out in the world who, who can give you access to, to Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. But I mean, if I got it right some weeks ago, was it a month or two ago? There is, since then, is even the possibility to invest in a normal uh, ETF, an exchange traded fund on your depot and being part of the Bitcoin universal, universal with that, right? I think you don't even have to invest directly. You can use the ETF for that if you want to do it on your normal depot. That's absolutely right. So if you obviously would like to benefit from somehow the financial potential growth in Bitcoin, there's also risk, by the way. What goes up can go down. Don't forget about this. Um, yes, there are alternative products, but um, if you want to own your own Bitcoins, then uh, you have to invest into a little infrastructure. Yeah. Totally different direction. Uh, Marco is asking, let's imagine the UPU wants to create a parallel Bitcoin. What is necessary to do it? Which obstacles, which guarantees? That's Question not difficult. Mark. It's not <laughs> difficult. Um, you, can, you can do so-called um, private blockchains. And they are already uh, available on a global basis. Um, so... What is, what is Bitcoin or especially Ethereum all about? Uh, in the end, it is a network of a protocol uh, with a computer so-called nodes. And they talk to each other and they make sure that the information is shared amongst all the, the players. And so this is called the distributed ledger technology that you basically have a big Excel spreadsheet with all the, the entries shared and distributed amongst everybody. That's how the so-called double spending problem has been solved. And what you can now say is you can do a copy and paste of this and just start it completely new amongst the private group. So you don't give access to the public. The beauty of Bitcoin and Ethereum is it's so huge. The security is basically in the, in, indefinitely high because you will never be able to really uh, attack more than 50 51%, for example. That's, that's what it would be needed that you somehow take the security away. If you have a smaller blockchain, but only a couple of people are organizing this, this can be done as well. But then again, you have, you have a security challenge you have to overcome. And there are blockchains, uh, for example, in very special situations like uh, logistics or pharma or also uh, information, um, that are using exactly such a blockchain. It is possible. It depends on you. If you just need somehow money transfers between one and two, you might also just take a Google spreadsheet and say, I owe Martin 10 US dollar and he owes me 10 Swiss francs. And uh, Martin and AP has to pay uh, two US dollars back. And so maybe blockchain is then not the ideal setup. Blockchain for me, is essential if you are working on a global basis with partners who you don't know and you have to trust. And the protocol itself gives you the trust. That's the most important element there. And therefore, obviously, the, uh, the currently public blockchains are very established and you don't have to start from scratch. I would, I would use a public blockchain. Mm -hmm. What about cross-border transaction? Kamlish is asking, what are your view in the main, what are the main risks associated with cross-border transactions, regulatory or others? 
of blockchain or, or cryptocurrencies, of course? Well, cryptocurrencies don't know borders. Um, uh, the I regulation, like <laughs> the regulation, though, is based on a on a domestic setup. And um, if you if you send Bitcoin to a country where Bitcoin is illegal, what is then happening to the local postal um, setup? They they then have Bitcoin, but they cannot do anything with them. Maybe they can send it back to Bern and say, well send me some US dollars or send me some Swiss francs or whatever. And so on a on a global basis, Bitcoin is really there without borders. It can be sent to any any market in any second. It takes a couple of seconds, maybe a couple of minutes. There are blockchains which are much faster. Um, the, the, the challenge is that you can exchange Bitcoin into money because in the end if you have bitcoins on your wallet and you need something to eat or something to drink or you have to pay a rent or you have to pay a salary you have to switch this back into the local currency and therefore what happened right now in el salvador is obviously perfect so people living el salvadorians who live outside of uh, el salvador can send bitcoin back to el salvador and they can go straight into the shop and use those bitcoins to pay for a coffee, for their rent, for whatever. And that's the main reason why El Salvador said bitcoin is a legal tender. And so it comes uh, cross-border and it can be used on a local basis, on a domestic basis. And so the question there is uh, those fiat crypto gateways, as, as I called them. How do you bring fiat into the crypto world and crypto back into the fiat world? That's, that's the challenge. That's why brokers are there, like Bitcoin Swiss, uh, but also exchanges like um, like uh, Coinbase or Bittrex or uh, Binance, and they obviously also have fiat fiat rail uh, fiat gateways there. Bringing me to the well uh, to the volatility. So Sally is asking Armin, how do you manage volatility risk when you're using crypto in? Postal settlements, or what you just discussed in El Salvador. So if I if I if I send some money there on a Bitcoin base, and while I'm sending it, it gets ten percent less value, twenty percent less value. So we see some volatility in these things. Is it really usable to do that? Aren't there big risks in the volatility of these currencies? Uh, obviously, yes, the volatility is there, uh, but it will it will flatten out. Right now, we still see a lot of volatility. That's absolutely right. Uh, but the reason, therefore, is you have a huge pile of Bitcoins and only a small volume gets traded. So the fluctuation, obviously, with a small amount can go up and down. In a couple of years, this is going to flatten out because in the end, the volumes are huge and also the value is much higher. And... So that's my personal uh, view, by the way. I still believe the 67,000 US dollar for one Bitcoin is still the beginning. But that's my personal view. Um, it is it is obviously an issue right now. But in the end, it is, especially when you're in a hyperinflation market, be it Venezuela, be it also in, in other markets where access to, to fiat is, is quite difficult. I rather live with volatility because it also might go up Versus, I don't. I just know that my money I have on my bank account just sees one direction, boom, and straight down. And therefore, it is it is on you to decide uh, what you what you believe. I just I just um, looked back in, at my investment. I did a couple of uh, years ago into into stock, which was fine as well, and into crypto. And I can tell you, my cryptos uh, performed a little bit better compared to my stocks. So it depends. It depends. So you say in a, in a short wording, uh, inflation is worse than volatility. Yes, absolutely. And I, I believe uh, with those printing machines, especially in the US and in Europe, um, in US dollar and in, in euros, I have some doubts. That's the reason why the first chapter was dedicated to what is money? Whom do you trust? It's your decision. Makes sense. Sergey is asking something. Uh, before offering cryptocurrency options to customer, as customers, what you as a business need to consider. That's interesting. So if I, as my company, I would like to offer a cryptocurrency salary or payments for my customers, what do I have to think of? 
you need a wallet. Yes. It can be here. It can be on the computer. It can be somewhere. That's a long number. And that's it. Uh, obviously, then we say send me Bitcoin, and uh, you can decide uh, for for what for how much it is. You can come to Bitcoin Swiss, or you can come to Worldline in Switzerland and say I would like to accept Bitcoin, but I don't like to own Bitcoins afterwards. So please, Armin, exchange them straight into Swiss francs or euros or US dollar. That's fine. There are other companies in the world doing this as well, by the way, not only us. Uh, there are BitPay and, and, and Coinbase and others are offering a similar service there as well. So in the end, it is not that much you need, uh, but the, the flexibility you get is also something where you get the security uh, at your hand. And this means if you have your own wallet with your own keys, you have to make sure that no one gets access to this. And uh, this means just make sure that the, the keywords are there or the access to the wallet are somehow secured. That's the challenge because if you send cryptos to an address, there is no one you can call. That's the beauty about the banking system. If something went totally wrong and I sent somehow I had a fat finger uh, attack and I sent uh, instead of 1 million, uh, said 100 million to an address or to, uh, to a bank account, I can call someone and say, hey, correspondence bank, please, please send it back. I did a mistake and it usually works. In Bitcoin, it's gone because it's gone. It's, gone. It, it's on this address. And you can call the person and say, are you willing to send it back to me? This happens as well, by the way. But it takes a little bit, little bit more effort. I mean, I don't know whether you had a chance to look a little bit into what is happening in the chat. It's, it's going down, down, down. There's more comments and more comments and more questions. And it's already one minute uh, to three. But I would like to, st uh, to end the session with one final question, which I think is, is very interesting. How can posts benefit from the cryptocurrencies is the Jigme Tenzin question. Um, some postal organizations are already into crypto stamps. So how can postal operators, postal companies benefit from cryptocurrencies? What do you think are the most important points from your point of view? Yes, crypto stamps, that's, that's a nice gimmick. Uh, obviously, in Switzerland, we have it. Um, I also just see here NFTs, um, uh, which are which are definitely also something, at least you can also have identity. So especially also linked to NFTs could be an identity. So you can clearly say if you own this uh, or if you own this F NFT, uh, which is a token uh, on this address, you can basically identify yourself as the owner of this address, which is something good. But it's, it's on a smaller scale. Honestly, um, on a bigger scale, um, I, I look towards what Libra uh, and DM tried to do is obviously to support and also what the Salvadorians are doing right now with their own uh, Jiva wallet and, and just uh, making Bitcoin as a legal tender, give access to underbanked and non-banked customers via cryptocurrencies. And I think if, if you have, um, if you have uh, a public responsibility and the social responsibility in your markets, And it's not only Switzerland, it's not only the US, it's not only Germany where you get easily access to a bank account. Obviously, I saw some uh, quite uh, interesting markets here attending this seminar as well. It is, it is not easy to give those people access uh, and financial inclusion. And especially what happened in El Salvador is definitely giving this financial inclusion to everybody, this opportunity there. And me personally, I believe as a postal union, And as a postal community, you should try somehow to make sure that everybody in this world gets access to those systems. Everybody gets access to financial services. Everybody gets also access to send money back without having to pay 10% in, in fees. Um, and I think this should be a part of a global community to say, let's make sure that we get financial inclusion for everybody who may not really be at the sunny side, like here in Central Europe, where you and I are, Martin and I, but maybe a little bit more remote. And I think we should, we should make sure that we generate some opportunities for a better world and a better, better humanity. Let's, let's call it this way.
I would like to discuss with you for the next two hours, but I think these words you just made are the perfect final words for that discussion. Using cryptocurrencies, using the, the technology behind it to give more financial inclusion and to make it a little bit better world. I think that's a very, very good final word, Armin. Thanks a lot for that. Um, there is a question whether we can do a second part of this webinar. <laughs> so, Sergey, I put you on moderator again. So if you want to answer that question, put on your camera, put on your microphone, and we will be happy to answer that question. There are coming a lot of thank yous from me, in case for all the others. Amen. thanks a lot for that presentation. Thanks a lot for that discussion. Sergey, you are on, coming to yeah. us. Th thanks, Armin. Thanks, Martin. Just looking at the discussion we had in the chat and, well, how people were curious and interested in the topic, definitely we need to do a second or probably a third and a fourth. Well, le let's see how it will go. So stay tuned. I hope that soon we will come with some news about that. I'm sure we will do. So I th say thank you to all of you. Um, somebody just wrote, it's the most, uh, let's, let's get it right. Uh, this is the most, where was that thing? The most dynamic webinar I've ever attended ever. So I th think I can agree to that. L looking for the chat, looking for, for the discussion. It was a very, very um, interesting and very lively uh, webinar. Thanks, Armin. Thanks, Ther Sergey, one again for making this possible. And I hope to see you again next year sometime. So let's have a nice time over the uh, Christmas time, over the holidays, and see you sometime next year. Bye-bye from all of us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.